Thank you, Brother Witherspoon. The Lord reigns. Yes, he does. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Yes, now, thank you, Jesus. He reigns, he reigns above every everything. Night, every storm. Everything. Every flood. Yes. Amen. Amen. He reigns over my circumstances. Yes. Giving me another chance. Yes. He reigns. He reigns. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, praise team, for positioning us to this morning to receive your word today. Father, we we just thankful to to be here, to Amen. be together. Amen. Every day, as the song says, is a day of Thanksgiving. Yes, Amen. It is. Amen. Every day he's blessing us yes, he in some is. form or fashion. Whether we see it in our natural eyes. We gotta, we gotta open up your spiritual eyes and see his goodness sometimes. Amen. It's not always visible with the natural eye. Amen. That's right. Especially if our eyes are focused on the wrong things. That's right. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Ooh, I feel a little preachy this morning. All right. All right. Let the Holy Spirit have his way. We're going to continue on this morning with our message, that our series that we've been covering on the trap of offense. And today's uh, is part three of this series, and we're going to talk about authority figures in the trap of offense. Today's title scripture is found in Luke 21. We're going to look at verse 16. And I want you to kind of remember, I want you to go back and remember when in Luke 17, when Jesus spoke to the disciples, he said something similar in a similar fashion in Luke 17 when he talked about it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Well, well, in Luke 21 and 16, he kind of breaks it out a little bit more in detail. Uh, we're gonna, when you get there, say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Luke 21 and 16. Mm. So Jesus is speaking and he's telling the disciples about the future. So he's, when he's speaking to the disciples, he's speaking to us as well. And he says in verse 16, and ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Wow. And ye shall, ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Wow. So betrayal is going to happen. And if we remember in, in part one, we said betrayal doesn't happen between somebody that we don't know, but it's with folks that we do know. So he's, the, Jesus is, is pointing out some of these potential candidates for betrayal. He said parents, brethren, kinfolk, and friends. So last week, we talked about, we talked about an offense from a brother or a sister. But we know that this type of offense, when we talk about Joseph and what he went through, mm -hmm. but this type of offense can also apply to a cousin, to a friend, to a coworker, to a church member. And if you remember last week, there was a question that was posed to all of us. And that question was this, if we are generally mistreated, do we have a right to be offended? Mm. What we learned last week as we studied Joseph is that we don't have a right to be offended. But what God does do, God gives us the right to choose whether we want to be offended or not. Mm -hmm. We can either give in to the trap of temptation and blame others or blame God or we can let go of the offense and leave it to God to address and, and, and allow God to fix us inside. Amen? Amen? Regardless of how we are mistreated, 
we learned that no other human being on earth or no devil can ever take us out of the will of God. That's right. We as individuals control whether we remain in God's will based on the decisions that we make. Mm -hmm. And as we studied Joseph last week, we were able to understand the pain that he experienced from the betrayal of his brothers, from the betrayal of Potiphar as well as Potiphar's wife. We saw the betrayal from the butler. Prayerfully, I hope that, that everybody was able to internalize Joseph's experience, you know, with our own personal experience of the chain of offense, you know, from a brother or sister or a loved one. So today we're going to talk about a situation that can be even more painful than a betrayal by a brother or a sister. You see, it's, it's one thing to experience rejection and ill will from a brother or sister, mm -hmm. but it's entirely different, church, when you experience rejection or ill will from a father or a mother. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, you see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. It's a whole different experience. There's a lot of children who are carrying heavy burdens, who, who, are, who, are, who are built, who, who've built walls of strong, spiritual strongholds in their lives because of parents. Some of them biological parents, mothers and fathers, but there are other, I'm not just referring to just biological fathers or mothers, but any leader that the Lord has put over us. That could be a husband, wives. That could be a manager at work. It could be an aunt. It could be an uncle. It could be a church leader. It could be a pastor. Mm -hmm. These people who lead us or feed us the word of God. Paul, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 4 and 15, he says, even if you had 10,000 teachers in Christ, he said, you don't have many fathers. These people of leadership and authority from God, we tend to raise the bar up on. We expect more from them. And if we remember in part one of this series, the greater the expectation, the greater potential of offense if we are mistreated by them. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk about a biblical example of this type of relationship where there was a spiritual father when he betrays his spiritual son. And the example we're gonna talk about today is regarding King Saul and David. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and we're gonna look at verse we're going to go to verse 13, so I'm going to set this up before we read it. We're going here to verse 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to look at verse 13. Actually, we may start a little bit early with this. So, to set this up, the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart. It's one thing if David described himself this way, right? Mm -hmm. Or one of his family members or friend described him this way. But this was God describing David in this fashion. Mm -hmm. So in order for God to, 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 to say David was a man after God's own heart, there had to be some actions that lined up with his description of him. So we're gonna see as we study how David handles offense from his spiritual father. Because, and, and the church, I want you to pay close attention because David's actions can help us learn some key principles about offense. All right? Mm -hmm. So David is the eighth son of Jesse, right? He was the baby. He, I would say he was the ignored son. Mm -hmm. Because you remember when the prophet Samuel, when he came to anoint the next king of Israel from Jesse's home, Jesse didn't even acknowledge David, did he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> David 
David was one of his sons. Mm -hmm. But Samuel couldn't, you remember Samuel was trying to pour the, the oil out of the horn. He couldn't get the oil to, to come out. Mm -hmm. And so let, let's, let's see what Samuel, so let's go to verse 11. It's, it kind of tells us what, and Samuel said unto Jesse, or hear thy all children. He said, don't, do you have another son? Something. The Lord told me to come here and, and, and that one of your sons was going to be anointed the next king of Israel. Do you have another son? And Jesse said, he said, and he said, it, it, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. David's out there tending the sheep. Hmm. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come here. So he sent and brought him in. And now he's now to describe him with David. Now he was a ruddy and with all of a beautiful count, good looking man, and goodly to look to. But what's beautiful, what's beautiful about what was about to happen, he's more beautiful inside than he was on the outside. We will see, we will see this. And the Lord says, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And watch this last verse. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Church, we can't overcome the spirit of offense without the spirit of the Lord leading us and guiding us to the path of righteousness. I want you to understand this. So at this moment, David and King Saul's lives are touched before they ever met one another. And the reason why I say this is because God anointed Saul to be the first king in Israel. Samuel was the one that anointed him as well. So that the two of them have been joined at this moment. And so, the same prophet, Saul, that anointed Saul, anoints David to be the next king of Israel. So David, as we know, he was 16 years old when this happened. He was a young man. And he spent his first 16 years of his life outside of the royal family. You know, he knows just a couple of people in King Saul's court you know, entourage or whatever. And we found out, we found out that the Lord, Lord's presence has departed Saul because of this pattern of disobedience. And, and what happens when God's presence leaves you, it allows the enemy to come in. So an evil spirit has come upon Saul. And what is happening, that evil spirit is, is, is troubling in his spirit or tormenting him. And so his only relief Saul's only relief came when someone would minister him to him by playing music, by playing the harp. So one of the king's servants who knew David told King Saul about him. And so if we go to skip down to 1 Samuel 16 and we look at verse 17 and uh, we see Saul requesting unto his servants. He says, and Saul said unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of his servants and said, behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and plain and a mighty valiant man, a man of, a man of war and prudent in manners and a comely person. And the Lord is with him. You see the connection? The Lord is with him. Mm -hmm. The Lord is with him. See, see, you see the importance of having the presence of the Lord in our lives as we compare what King Saul is going through and what David is, where David is in his life spiritually. So the king requests that David come to the palace to minister to him by playing his harp. So David is, David is probably like, cool. God is fulfilling his promise to me, you know. This is my opportunity to gain favor from the king. This is my, my foot in the door. This is my opportunity. This is my, this is my chance, almost like an entry-level position. 
to position me for one day becoming king. So another event happened, I don't know if it was before or, or after this event, there was another event in which the children of Israel were battling the Philistines. And this large giant warrior named Goliath was making a mockery of the Israelite army. And this goes on for about 40 days. Y'all remember this, right? And so King Saul made this offer to the troops that whoever takes out Goliath, that he would receive great riches and take his, take, uh, he would give his daughter uh, to that person for marriage. So we know David is out tending the sheep. His dad tells him to come and go check on his brothers. So he comes and he hears about all this. So he, he's up for the task. Remember, the presence of the Lord is with David. He goes out, he kills Goliath, using the power of God that worketh in him, and he ends up receiving the riches in, in Saul's daughter in marriage. Now, as a result of, of these, these two different scenarios, David won Saul's favor as a result of this. And what happened was, King Saul brought David into the palace to serve as the king armor bearer. And then later he became a military leader. Not only that, but Saul also requests that David sit and eat at his table. Mm -hmm. Then David and Saul's oldest brother, Jonathan, become as friends. Saul recognized, Saul understood the presence of the Lord in David. And any task that he gave David to do, the hand of the Lord was on him. And, and, and it prospered. And, and it sounds just like, like Joseph. Anything that Joseph was, was given authority over, it prospered. Saul knew this. So David is looking at this like, wow. Yeah, this is what the Lord had in store for me I see the prophecy is unfolding right now David is seeing the favor of God all over him his life right now and he's seeing God is, is good, God is faithful and I've got a father figure in King Saul to help me to grow and to develop tell you something it's funny how fast a good situation can change, huh? Mm -hmm. right. I know we, we know this story. Mm -hmm. We've been there. Things are rolling along smooth. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's a bump in the road. Everything's rolling well. Trouble comes out of nowhere. So one day, King Saul and David, they were returning from battle and they joined one another side by side. And there were some women from all of the cities of Israel who come out and dance and sing. And we're gonna see how quickly this relationship changes. We're gonna to go to Psalms 6, 1 Samuel chapter 18. And we're gonna look at verse six. 1 Samuel chapter 18, and we're gonna look at verse six. There, say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. All right. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul, Saul with tablets with joy and with instruments of music. And the women women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and the sin displeased him. And he says, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom. He said he already got 
oh, he, he's already getting credit for killing more people than me. So what else does he have to take from me? The kingdom. And verse 9 says, and Saul eyed David from that day forward. And forward. Wow. Wow. Hmm. We can see that the chain of offense has taken root immediately with Saul. Remember, Saul, the presence of the Lord, has left Saul because of his dis disobedience. That gives a crack for the enemy to come in and plant the fits in him. And you see how quickly it takes place. You know, sometimes church fear, insecurity, intimidation, or jealousy leads others to attack us. You know? Leads folks to attack us because you know what it does? Sometimes our strengths exposes their weaknesses. And the person gets scared and says, oh, I don't want this person to take my spot. So what I got to do is I got to get rid of that person, find a way to get rid of that person. That's where the betrayal, that chain of offense starts. But God doesn't, God has a place for everybody in his house. We shouldn't be intimidated. We shouldn't have fear because somebody comes up and they have some gifts that we don't have. We all have a part of God's body to offer. Everybody has a place. And we have to recognize and be able to love that person and nurture that person to, 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 to make sure that their gifts are, are fully utilized to, to uplift the kingdom. So as a result of all of this, that, that, that this, this chain of events that happens on Saul, he, he attempts to kill, kill them on multiple occasions. Multiple occasions, church. So, so things got so bad in the relationship that David had to flee. He had to leave the courts and go. And what happened is he ended up going to a town called Noah. And it was the city of the priests. And David goes there, you can tell David just had to leave with nothing because he was hungry and he didn't have anything to defend himself. So he goes to the priest and he's asked for some bread and he asked for some, 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 a sword. So the, so, the, so the priest gave him some bread and he gave him the sword of Goliath. So he leaves and he goes, David goes and, and hiding in the wilderness. Well, well, this is why I'm gonna tell you, I'm, 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 I'm bringing this part out. Saul finds out that some, through some of his folks that David received assistance from the priest that know. So King Saul got so offended, he ordered that all the priests, their families, wives, children, all, all the people in them know to be executed. He wiped out an entire community church Saul has lost his mind. Mm -hmm. He's gone crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Think about this, church. And I want you to think about this part. And I'm going to... David didn't choose Saul. He didn't choose to work for Saul. God put David under Saul. So, so one thing that we have to always understand, we can't always judge a person based on the leader that they're under. When God has placed them there. You heard, right. you heard that part. When God has placed them there. Right. When God has placed you there, sometimes it's unfair. It's unfair to judge David based on Saul's issues, right? right. Sometimes we like to put put people together, group people together, but we can't always, we can't, we can't do that. You couldn't judge Samuel based on Eli. You go back and look at some of the decisions that Eli made as a, as a prophet doesn't line up with what Samuel did. So we gotta beware and not place judgment on somebody in that particular situation. Just want us, want us to understand that. So we understand that King Saul is basically schizophrenic right now. He's got multiple personalities. Sometimes he's okay, sometimes he's, he's not okay. But that's what happens when the presence of the Lord leaves somebody. And, and you have the, you got these spirits that torment them. 
So what happens is King Saul gathers 3,000 men and leads them to hunt down David. So we're going to see what happens. We're, going to, we're getting ready to see a test that's getting ready to take place. The Lord is, is about to test David. We're going to go to 1 Samuel 20, 20, chapter 24. We're going to look at verse, start at verse 1. So David now, at this point, David has gathered a group of 600 men with him. And what happens is they are in the caves of Engeh. They're hiding from Saul and his men. So David's been away. He hasn't seen his family. He hasn't seen his friends or loved ones at all. He's on the run constantly to keep from being killed by his spiritual father, his mentor. So let's, 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 read, let's read 1 Samuel 24. And it says, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engei. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coast by the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Wow. David and his men are hiding in the cave when Saul and his boys roll in. Okay? So... When it says Saul went in to cover his feet, some people say he went to use the bathroom, you know, take a break, bathroom break. So, of course, when they come in, Saul and then the men come in, they sit, they put down all of their weapons, they take off some of their clothes because they get ready to take a bathroom break. So they lay out all of their weapons and all that. Meanwhile, David and all his boys are in the, in the cave too, hiding deep in the cave, and they sit there watching this. They're watching all of this. Do you recognize the test that the Lord has given to David? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see the test coming? Yeah. So let's, 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 let's read verse 4. And the men of David said to him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto to thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into mm -hmm. thine hand, thou, that thou mayest do to him as if she shall seem good unto thee. Then David rose, arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. David's men are saying, the Lord has handed us our enemies right into our hands. The Lord has provided this opportunity for us to take Saul out. Question for you. Does David have a right to seek revenge on King Saul at this moment? The man who has on multiple occasions attempted to kill him. Can you, can you, can you imagine the emotions that's going on in that cave? Mm -hmm. We talked about this Wednesday night. You gotta be, you can't, you can't let those emotions you may have the feelings, but you can't let your actions line up with your emotions in situations like this. Because if you do, it'll get you off of the path that God wants you to be on, church. Can you imagine the emotions that are going on in that cave? They're sitting there, prime targets to get wiped out. David's been running, running away, hasn't been able to talk or be able to see his family and friends, he's got, this man's trying to take him out. And he has an opportunity to do the same thing to take him out. So let's see what he does. Let's see what, how David responds. He said, the, 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 Bible, the scripture says, David was a man after God's own heart. We'll see by his actions whether he's a man after God's own heart. It says in verse 5, you know, the day he rose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily, and it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. David's upset with himself for even cutting off the skirt of Saul. It, it bothered him. And he said unto the, his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Didn't, look, didn't, didn't the Lord anoint Samuel to be king? Same, right? 
All authority is, 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 is provided God. He gives, he gives instruction. He, he anoints all of his leadership. So he said, I can't do this. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. He said, David tells, he tells, tells his, his brothers to stay down. Mm. It's not my place to seek judgment right. on God's anointed leadership. Mm -hmm. Even though Saul's behavior was ungodly, doesn't, has nothing to do with his position. You, you see where I'm going. Has nothing to do with his position. His position drives whether we make that decision to do stuff. So, so what it looks like, a lot of times we, we get caught up in people's behavior, but don't understand the position that they're in, the, the, the anointed position that they're in. And, and, and David is just showing, he, he's, he's showing his, that he has a God, he has a heart for God, and, and he, wants to, he wants to do God's will. He knows God's will is not to take Saul out. And David has passed this text. So let's, let's look a little bit further on and, and, and go to uh, verse 8 through 11, because David is, he's, he's going to speak to Saul afterwards. It says in verse 8, David also arose afterwards. And he went out of the cave, and he cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And said, and David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how the Lord has delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some begged me to kill thee, but my eye spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Mm. Wow. David is pouring out his soul to Saul. You know, he's basically telling you, telling Saul, somebody lied. He's thinking somebody is giving him, telling, telling bad things about him to, to Saul. So, you know, Saul's got some people saying bad things about David. He said, no. Somebody, whoever's telling you this bad stuff about me, they're lying. Mm. David wanted Saul to see his faithfulness and his loyalty to him. He's, he's telling them that he's not after his kingdom. And he's hoping that this display of love will cause Saul not to be angry with him anymore. Mm. And I want you to think about, have we ever, ever done that to our father or our mother? Trying, you don't understand why they're they're treating you the way that they're treating you, and you're trying to show them, hey, I'm trying to prove to them, hey, I'm, it's not me. It's not me. So Saul recognizes David's loyalty, and then he asked David to promise that he will not destroy him or his family. And so David makes this, this promise, and then King Saul and his men leave. So after this incident occurs, David, you know, you can imagine David's like, okay, all right, thank you, Lord. I have proven to my king that my heart is sincere to him and I don't want to take his throne. So Saul's going to, he's going to restore me back into his court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, church, mm -hmm. the story's not over. If we didn't recognize before, King Saul is praying. He's not in his right mind. So two chapters later, in 1 Samuel 26, we see that David and his men are in the hills of Hakalah. And guess who shows back up again? King Saul and his 3,000 men. Can you imagine the devastation in David? at this moment. Hmm. Can you imagine the pain that he's dealing with, church? He's saying, my God, my God, what more do I have to do to prove my loyalty and my faithfulness for my king? What more, what more do I, what more can I do? Have we been there? Have we been there, church? 
So the two groups are people on two opposite sides of, of the valley. So the Lord put Saul and his men into a deep sleep, right? And David sees this and he asks his boys, who will go with me to Saul's camp? So we get ready to experience the second test for David. So one of David's warriors named Abishai says, I'll go with you. Now, for those of you who don't know who Abishai is, let's just say the Lord selected the perfect person to test David. You see, Abishai was one of Joab's younger brothers. And, and, and they, the three of them boys, they were called the executioners. If you needed somebody to put in work for you, you call on those boys. I know what y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you had some friends, all you had to do was say it's time to fight, they'd be ready. Some of y'all may have been some of those people. <laughs> the boys, these boys are like Marshawn Lynch. I'm about that action, boss. They were about that action. Taking care of business. So David and Abishai, they snuck into Saul's camp. And they go right to where Saul is laying. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel 26. And we're going to read verse 7 and 8. It's going to start off. It says, so David and Abishai come to the people by night. And behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench. And his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay around about him. Then said Abishai to David, God has delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. <laughs> Ooh, can, you, can you see this picture? Abishai got the spear, he's got it cocked back, and he's ready. He's ready for, for David to give him the green light. To throw. He said, I only need but one thrust, and, it, and he's going to be out. I'm going to take him out. He said, Do you remember this plea a couple of chapters ago? You know, Saul has been a constant thorn in David's side for years now. You didn't try to prove yourself to him, David, many occasions. He's not listening. God has given you another opportunity to take him out. You can be king and you can get our country back on track. Can, can you hear that? Can you hear that feeling? You can feel the emotion that, that's riding in, the, in, in, in David as he's at this moment. This king has killed innocent priests and women and children. Just give me the green light, David. I'll take him out for you. Just one thrust. David doesn't give Abishai the green light. You go to verse 9, it says that David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Wow. David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. Or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointing. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of his water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of the water from Saul's bolster, and they that and they got them away, and no man saw it nor knew it, neither awakened, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was falling upon them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, another test of faith. God was preparing, he's preparing David because he knows David's gonna be the next king. And he's basically telling him in these tests, okay David, are you gonna trust me? Or are you going to take matters into your own hands and get outside my will? David has passed these first two tests by saying, I'm not executing judgment on Saul. 
Lord, I leave judgment up to you. You see, there's a difference between Saul and David. Saul was a man after his own heart. David was a man after God's heart. And why do we know this, church? Because David refused to seek revenge after being mistreated. So David speaks to Saul again after they awaken and shares with him again that he spared his life. Saul recognizes it, accepts it, and he leaves again. So we know after this particular passage that judgment did come against Saul, but it wasn't by David, but it was by God. The divine discipline, you remember Pastor Spradley taught us about divine discipline. This is a progressive thing that happened. He, he, he ended up getting dealt with the school of hard knocks. And, God, and the Lord uses the world to bring judgment on his anointing. And that's what happened to Saul. Saul, as well as his son, Joe, Jonathan, they both died in battle with the Philistines. But there's a, there's a final test that God is giving David when he finds out that Saul was killed by the Philistines. Let's, let's see how he reacts, church. We know, we know David spent over 14 years hiding from Saul. He was away from his family, his loved ones, all because of his leader. And you would think, church, after all the pain Saul administered to David, that he would rejoice after hearing he was dead. So let's, let's go to 2 Samuel. We're going to look at chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 2. 2 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 2. Let me say, get that, say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And it, it came even to pass on the third day that behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did ab ab obeisance. And David said unto him, For whence comest thou? And he said, Out of the camp of Israel I am escaped, am I escaped? And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people are also fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. So we have a man that comes from the camp of Saul. And he tells David that King Saul and Jonathan are dead. Now, this, this person also lies to David and tells David that he was the one that finished them off. <laughs> you know, because what he, what he wanted to do, he knew that. He knew what Saul had done to David. So he, he figured if he could tell David that he was the one that took him out, that, he, that David would give him some type of approval, mm -hmm. uh, you know, give a pat on the back, give him something for, for what he did. Mm -hmm. Let's see how David responds. Mm -hmm. We're going to skip over to verse 11. It says, Then David took hold of on his clothes and rent him, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for all for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. David does the total opposite of what the world would do in a situation like this, church. He mourned, he wept as well as his men did. David even wrote a song and he taught his men this song that honored Saul. The same man that judged him, church, the same man, the, the, the same man that God judged and fell from his grace, the same man that persecuted 
David, David, in response, writes a love song to honor him. And he teaches it to all of his men. That tells us, church, right there, we need to ask the Lord for his heart in our lives. Church, the song says, give us a heart, give us your heart. Give us your heart, Lord. Natural man can't, can't, can't love, can't, can't have a heart like that uh, when somebody offends them in such a way. It takes the heart of God in us to keep us from a finished church. So let's, let's skip on down to verse 14 to see how he responds to, the, to this man who, who, who tells him that he, he was the one who wiped out King Saul. So David speaks to this man in verse 14. He says, and David said unto him, how wast that thou not afraid? How are you not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointing? And David called one of the young men and said, go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And he said unto him, thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. I guess we thought David was a softy. Mm -hmm. David understood this principle about not putting your hands on the Lord's anointing. We need to understand this church as well. God anointed Saul as king and only God could remove him from office. He considered, David considered what that man did was as a crime. And he immediately dealt with it by having him executed right then and there on the spot. And not only did David write the song, I'm going I'm to I'm let you know something else that he did. And it's in the, it's in the script. Not only did he write it, he, had, he wrote a song to honor Saul. This is what he also did. After he found, he sought after a descendant of Saul and brought that descendant of Saul into his court when he became king. And he set him up and he sat at his table and ate with David, just like Saul did for him. Wow. Wow. I know some of you probably saying something to, in effect, like so the disciples told, to, uh, responded to Jesus after he said, you gotta forgive your brother seven times in one day. Lord, increase my faith. But I'm going to tell you something. With God and with his heart, all things are possible, church. All things are possible. When you have God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit operating as they should in your life, all things are possible. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. He's higher than any other. So, the, so I want us to understand some key points from this story. The first key point I want us to understand is this. It's God's assignment to assess judgment on others and not ours. That's number one. We're going to go. Uh, we'll go to Hebrews. I'm going I'm to jump to the New Testament. Hebrews 10. We're going to go to verse 30. Hebrews 10. Verse 30. When you get there, say Jesus is Lord. And it says in Hebrews 10, verse 30, it says, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, said the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Vengeance, or we could say revenge, or payback, belongs to the Lord, church. Right. He is the only righteous judge. And we must trust his plan for judgment and not our plan for judgment. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is with offense, we fall into this trap. We fall into this scandal on if we don't recognize this church, if we're not alert. 
And the Lord doesn't want us to be trapped with events in our hearts. And we have to be so cautious about emotions, not allowing our emotions to, to, to cause us to pursue revenge or to get even or to get payback, church. That's not God's will for us. He is the judge, not us. Second point I want us to, I want us to understand today is that all leaders are not perfect. There is no godly, no perfect parent. There is no perfect spouse. There is no perfect manager. There is no perfect pastor. Godly leaders make mistakes at times. We make mistakes at times. For Romans 3 and 23 says, for every, everyone, all have seen and have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and 10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us can boast about being better than somebody else. That's why Jesus came to bring us grace. That's why, the, that's why God gave us grace, because it puts us all on the same playing field to start with. Now, how we operate with grace, how, how we operate our grace is up to us, but that grace is available to everyone. Amen? We, we cause major offense to come our way when we see leaders make mistakes, especially when it involves us, you know, because we set those high expectations. Church, we need, we need to show grace to our leaders, and our leaders need to show grace to us. It works both ways. It works both ways. And when we have situations that come up, we got to handle these situations in, in a godly manner. We have to walk in love. Always have to remember that church. The last point I want to make as I close is this. Not all leaders are godly. Not all leaders are godly. We're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 2 verse Peter chapter 2 we're going to look at verses 13 look at verse 13 you get to say Jesus is Lord Jesus is Lord it says scripture says submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether to whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. This is what I want us to understand, church. The Holy Spirit is, is, is teaching this principle. A leader's behavior may not be from God, but their authority is from God. Get that down. Get that in your spirit. A leader's behavior may not be from God, but their authority is from God. Therefore, their ungodly behavior doesn't give us the right to take offense and get revenge or be disrespectful to them. David was a man after God's own heart because he did not seek revenge when it came to somebody that was under his authority. We read on in verse 16 and 17 of this passage, it says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. The king that Peter is referring to in this scripture was King Nero. He was part of the Agrippa of family of kings and they were known for murdering Christians in cold blood to gain political favor with people so how can God you know the question is how can God tell us to respect such a person who does such cruel things the Holy Spirit wants us to see beyond their behavior and see the position that God has placed them under 
You got to look beyond the behavior and look at the position. In America, this is what we do. Our way for respect is you, you got to earn my respect, mm -hmm. right? You got to earn my respect to get my respect. But that's not how the fear of God works. The fear of God doesn't say that. The fear of God says, I see the authority that God has placed on you. Therefore, you already have my respect mm -hmm. because I honor your position and not your behavior. Mm -hmm. I want y'all to understand this. We as Christians, we must be careful about how we talk about people whose authority that we are under. The Holy Spirit is saying to us today, we got to grab hold of this principle because we can break free from a lot of deep offense that we have against parents, against managers, against church leaders. Because some people feel they have a, a right to retaliate against a father or a mother because of their behavior. And what happens is, what happens is we fall out of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And we get trapped in a fence. God calls us to honor the position of authority and not the behavior. That's how we can honor a king who tries to kill us. Mm. That's how we can honor a king that tries to kill Christians. Mm. And I want to share this last principle to you. There is, an, there is an exception to not obeying someone who has authority over us. And that's if that person asks us to sin. We have a right to refuse at that point because at this point, there's a higher authority that, that, takes, that takes place when someone talk, tells us to sin. That behavior goes to another level of authority. And we're going to discuss this more next week. But I want us to understand this point. You remember Shadrach. You remember Meshach. You remember Abednego and, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar. And they, King Nebuchadnezzar told them, he requested them to bow down to his statue when they played the jam, right? They refused to do that. But you didn't say, man, Joe, I'm not going to do that, fool. I'm not going not to bow down for you. They, didn't, they never said that. They never came at him with disrespect. They always responded with him with respect and honor. They, 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 they took his behavior out the picture and they looked strictly at his position and said, no, Lord, I'm, I, no, King, I'm not going to, to do this. Sometimes we get ourselves out of whack mm -hmm. because we get so focused on the behavior that we don't focus on the position church. We got to understand this principle and we have to apply it. The greatest church, the greatest offense can come from people who are under authority and not from our brothers and sisters and our I pray that this message opens our spiritual eyes and opens our spiritual ears and has helped us in some form or fashion today. May God bless you and may God's light shine upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.